right. Hey, folks, this is uh, Steve Lundgren coming to you with my new series called Piano Man Steve's Independent Artist Spotlight, which is a name that I gave it because I don't even know how often I'm going to do this, but uh, occasionally I come across someone that I'm really impressed by on YouTube, and uh, this young man I'm talking to today is one of them, and I just thought I should mention it to you and introduce you to him if he was willing to, and luckily he was. Uh, my guest today is Kevin Lawrence. And Kevin Lawrence is a stellar singer, songwriter, piano player. He's naturally thin. I kind of envy him. I hate him a little bit, but I really, really admire his work a lot. And uh, just a couple of bullet points on him. We're just going to have a little conversation, sort of like we've done with the conversations with the Masters folks. And uh, he uh, started playing the piano by ear at the age of six. He's written and recorded three studio albums. He has over 11,000 YouTube subscribers, and of course, he's available for weddings, corporate events, anniversaries, etc. You can get a free quote at KevinLawrenceMusic.com. Please welcome to the stage here, my new friend, Kevin Lawrence. Thanks for being with us yeah, today. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And let me, let me just say before you start shooting off the questions that I'm such a huge fan of Steve's as well. I saw a couple covers of his a few years back, and somehow we started communicating online and I asked him to give me a shout out on one of my favorite Billy Joel songs which is not very well known it's called Roberta and he did such an incredible job and I think Steve is is an awesome piano player and has this really natural uh, ability to just sing well and not try to sound like anybody else he sounds like himself just great guy great singer so thank you Steve for having me thank you Thank you. I'll be sure to get you a little extra in that kickback, I promise. That's all right. Yeah, we arranged, we arranged that earlier. All right, we can continue now. <laughs> awesome. No, I appreciate the kind words. Well, first of all, uh, I want to point out the reason that I wanted you guys to know about him isn't just because I like Kevin. It's because if you're subscribed to my channel, then it means you like what I do. And if you like what I do, I think that you're going to like what Kevin does. So I hope that a lot of you will go over and uh, subscribe to his channel and start watching his videos, become a fan, and uh, buy his EP. And that's kind of what this is about. This is uh, independent artists who are out there uh, trying to make our own way, helping each other out. So let's start with the beginning here. Kevin, where do you come from? I'm originally from uh, Miami, Florida. I uh, was there, I basically grew up there, and then I went to college at uh, Florida State, and uh, went back home to Miami for a couple of years, started working, and then I decided to pick up and move to Los Angeles, which is where I've been for the past uh, six and a half years. All right. All right. This doesn't have anything to do with music, but now that I know that you went to Florida State, I just have to ask, are you a sports yeah. fan, and have you always rooted for the Florida State teams? I am not a sports fan. I grew up being terrible at all sports, and I never got into watching it. My brothers and my family definitely uh, were more okay. into it. But, well, uh, I'm glad to know yeah. that because my Nebraska Cornhuskers have sort of an ugly history with most Florida teams, uh, Florida right. State one in particular. So yeah. the fact that you're not really into that makes it easier for us to be friends. So. I'm not. Yeah, I'm glad. No, it was a fun school. It was a good, it was a good school. It, I had a good time, and that's really where it ends for me. <laughs> Very good. Very yeah. good. So do you come from a musical family, or are you the anomaly? I don't, yeah. There's there's really no one in my family, and I, I come from a big family uh, that that sings or plays any instruments. My dad, uh, who passed away when I was 15, he I remember he was such a huge fan of music. We would always have music playing in the house constantly. He had a great turntable set up, and... So I, I, I think uh, he had a lot to do with my passion for music. I just somehow was able to take it to actually being able to play music. So, but well, nobody, that's, yeah. That's awesome. So you just, at the age of six, started picking some stuff out. Is that how it worked? Or did you ever take lessons? Or Yeah, we had a piano at our house like most families did. I don't know if that's the case anymore. I guess the, the piano was one time a symbol of success even if you didn't really play it mm -hmm. so uh, we we had one and um, I guess I would just I'd come home from summer camp and start figuring out melodies of songs that we would be singing uh, at camp that day 
And I guess my mom started kind of noticing that I had a bit of a musical ability. And from there, I started taking uh, some piano lessons. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, to this day, would you consider yourself good at, I, I mean, let me tell you what I am, and then you <coughs> tell me how you stack up on this same uh, scale. I certainly know how to read music, but I'm terrible if you just put like, you know, sheet music in front of me and ask me to sit down and sight read it. I'm just, I'm, you, you would have no idea that I have any abilities whatsoever if you put me in that situation, but it's not that I don't know all the notes and where they are on the page and all of that. I just am so much more comfortable with chord symbols and whatnot. Uh, did you develop sight reading uh, skills a little bit better than I did? Uh, no, on the contrary, actually, you're probably uh, quite a few notches above me when it comes to reading music, believe it or not. Uh, no, I, in fact, to this day, right now, I, you put a piece of music in front of me, and I literally have to do that. Every good boy does fine. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating. All no, cars you know, eat gas. <laughs> right, exactly. F-A-C-E, right? Yep. That's for the spaces. Uh, no, I... Um, I started when I started taking piano lessons from day one to the day that I stopped when I was about 14 years old, from seven to 14. Uh, I had a very, very, very hard time reading the music. I, I just, I, I remember my my piano teacher telling my mom, I'll never forget it. One day she said, Kevin's reading ability is here, and his playing ability and ear ability is here. So it was it was always a struggle, and I learned how to read chord charts when I joined the high school jazz band, which to me was, um, I think, the, the biggest um, the, or the most beneficial piece of education in music that I had gotten even to this day. Being able to read chord charts and to play by ear, the two of those together, as I'm sure you know, uh, it's Liberating. Great. It's Absolutely. liberating. And that's, I mean, that it, you because you're already where you're at, you're probably not, you don't watch my video lessons, but what I teach people is chords and rhythm patterns that you can plug them into and then, you know, improvisation techniques. And it's, you know, it opens up a whole new world because if you were like me, I just didn't really have, it's not that I don't respect that style of piano playing. When I see someone who's brilliant at reading music on the page i'm i'm very impressed but that was never what i wanted to do i wanted to be like the people i was hearing on the radio and that clearly was not what they were doing no no so. it definitely wasn't and uh in fact when i when i started one of my best friends for my whole life we both kind of started playing the piano at the same age he also played by ear but he went the different route he went the classical music route and now he's uh he's a uh, graduate of the manhattan school of music and classical piano so uh, he's amazing, but it's a whole kind of real, oh, a whole different way of, of approaching music. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, uh, were you a music major? I wasn't. When I, when I got into Florida State, I, I had auditioned and was accepted into the piano jazz program. And my first semester, I had a change of heart and I, I left the program and decided to go into business because... I just didn't really what, know what else to go into. Good Lord. I swear to God, you could be telling my biography here. It's so yeah. crazy. I'm not <laughs> kidding. I was a music major. took me two and a half years to make the same decision, and then I switched to communications with a business and marketing emphasis. So it, It's the same. Yeah, it, it's the same thing where I went there, and it was like, you know, I'm certainly a good enough musician to be among them, but I'm not. they're not teaching what, they're not teaching to my strengths and it's just a struggle all the time. It's just not yeah. where I belong. So, right. yeah. Okay. You have to, you have to devote your whole life in college to jazz. Yeah. And if you're not passionate about it and you're more passionate about rock and roll and singer songwriter stuff, it's not going to work. No. And, and let's face it. I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. Uh, Cause I, I met, I have some really good friends uh, and some instructors from that era that I'm still very very fond of and close to but there is a bias against popular music inside yeah. those circuits too they just don't look at it as a serious uh, art form and that doesn't work for me because it's something that I wanted to devote my life to so you know right. 
Yeah, feel anyway. the same way. Excuse me. <coughs> no I'm just problem. getting over a cold. I was telling Steve earlier, so apologies in advance for the uh, stuffy nose and coughing. See, now, I, I got to give you a marketing tip. What you needed to do there is go, <laughs> sorry, I, I just got done with a 10-day run at the Greek theater, and uh, uh, my throat's a little sore, and, uh, you we, know, it was very We didn't fulfilling. rehearse that, yeah. It was yeah, very yeah. fulfilling, Next time. but, uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Next time. So, <laughs> all right, so let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Who uh, are your influences in music? Who brought you to the dance? It, it may be a shocker, but uh, definitely Billy Joel, first and foremost. Uh, it's cheesy, but I remember hearing Piano Man when I was a kid, and that's kind of what, what kind of turned on that light for me. And Elton John also. I saw um, Elton John and Billy Joel face-to-face it's that tour that they've done over the years, on and off. Uh, back in 2002, I was um, I was six, 15 or 16, and it it really changed my life. I was like, oh man, I I can't even fathom what it's like to be on that stage, in this arena with those lights and the sound, and that's something I just want to do more than anything. So even to this day, Billy Joel and Elton John, I've seen them in concert a million times apiece. Um, I, but there's many others too, but they're the they're the first two. The Beatles are up there also. Again, how about you, Steve? Telling me my life story. When I was 15, it was the 1994 inaugural face to face that I went to, yeah. and uh, it was in uh, Cyclone Stadium in Iowa, and it changed my life just like it did yours. Yep. So I understand that. Uh, now, what I do think <laughs> is kind of fun, uh, from what I've been able to tell, because you know. Uh, for those of you watching, if you haven't seen any of Kevin's videos, he and I have uh, very different singing voices. I've got kind of a big, rascally, you know, kind of powerhouse, almost uh, suited to more country-influenced voice. And Kevin's got a little bit higher tenor, um, different kind of timbre. Certainly, he has the ability to be a little more angelic than I than I do, and so what I see is interesting as we start with the same foundation of Billy Joel, Elton John, the Beatles, that kind of thing, uh, and then Kevin's clearly been influenced, I can see, by uh, more modern pop uh, going through, like Coldplay, uh, Bruno Mars, these kinds of artists, and uh, coming from Nebraska, where I did, I ended up being more influenced I did not start out a country fan, but when you're living in uh, Nebraska and traveling all over small towns, the western half of that state, and you are trying to have a music career, you better learn to play some country or else you're not going to get booked. And I became a fan by playing it. So I have a much more country influence and direction, and you've got more of a, a modern uh, pop, alternate postmodern pop going on, I notice. It's kind yeah, of definitely. And, and Steve, I mean, I, just to say about Steve's voice, I'm, I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke here. I'm, I'm truly envious of, of Steve's. He has this real natural ability to, to sing. It almost seems effortless, and he's always on, on key and on pitch. Uh, and he has a really nice tone to his voice. If you watch some of my uh, videos pre 2013, 2014, I used to do that kind of really cheesy early John Mayer sound where he's kind of like real breathy, like, ah, ah, and you didn't have any power. And uh, I guess over time I was able to come out of that. So if, if you watch my earlier videos, which I'd rather you not, uh, if you watch my <laughs> videos from the past couple of years, you can see what I sound like now. Um, but uh, Steve has always had that kind of more powerful, uh, clearer, uh, more um, just sort of uh, natural ability to sing. For me, it's, it's been more of a struggle. Piano has been easier. The singing has been harder. It's, a, it's always a work in progress. Well, I think you're a fantastic singer, and you do things with your voice that I just don't have in the toolbox, and I, I admire that. I've learned over time I, I'm not terribly envious usually anymore uh, because I think the most productive thing for anyone as a musician to do is to celebrate their strengths and, you know, and, and live inside their umbrella of strengths uh, more than – worry about what they don't do well, but I, I really appreciate the compliments. But one of the things that I've been impressed by Kevin with is his singing. He's got a beautiful falsetto voice that uh, he can use to great effect. And for me, hell, half the time, 
one of the one of the bad <laughs> effects of the way that I sing is that uh, as soon as I use my power for longer than about ten minutes, my falsetto voice is gone. <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's tough to keep it going. It's it's yeah. a problematic situation for me, but I like that. So your influences, of course, are Billy Joel and Elton John. Now, what are your musical aspirations? They've, uh, I'm, I'm sure you can relate to this. They've they've changed a lot over the years. Uh, when I when I came to LA, I wanted to pursue songwriting. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to make albums. I wanted to go on tour. And all those things that musicians like you and me really want to do. Um, and then it's kind of morphed. I I saw that uh, I I wanted a little bit more uh, stability in my life, a little bit more financial security. Um, so I was somehow able to um, morph it into making a living playing music, not as a songwriter and as a quote unquote rock star. But uh, there's a nice market out there in, in corporate events and in weddings and even retirement communities, which is a big part of what I do. I mean, everybody deserves to hear some music. Uh, so if they like it and they're going to throw you a few bucks to come and play for them, you know, that's, uh, it sounds pretty good to me. But it's definitely, it was, it was uh, wild to be able to accept that and not only accept it, but learn to really... Uh, enjoy what it is that I'm doing and say, hey, you know what? In the end, I'm making a living playing music. What more can you really ask for? Not sitting in a cubicle, not delivering pizzas, not yeah. any of that. Yeah, I know. I have the same I have the same thing. Uh, in my case, I, um, <clears throat> I certainly play, I play about 100 gigs a year, probably sometimes as much as 150, but I don't like it when I play that many. Uh, yeah. But I have really worked hard to create revenue <coughs> streams through the internet so that I could supplement it and spend a little bit more time at home. And, uh, you know, my recording career, at least at this point in time, is mostly what I do out of my living, out of my, you know, spare bedroom. So, yeah, and let me okay. interrupt you one second. I want to give you a quick plug. I actually just recently purchased Steve's uh, new album on iTunes, and it's awesome. I've been listening to it, so check it out. It's, it's a real. Uh, throwback to the uh, the Billy Joel and Elton John that that uh, we really love. So great well, work on the new record. Thank you very much, and I am going to give you a plug as well. That's coming up. I'm going to ask you a couple other questions first, and then we're going to end with some of your uh, recorded works because I am extremely impressed by those. Um, very cool. So everyone always asks me this, and I'm a complete like idiot with technology if you want to know the truth it's like i've learned enough to turn the stuff on but i'm not really all that good at it so people ask me what gear should i get and i go i don't know something that makes noise but i can tell that you are more <coughs> savvy with that than i am i can just tell what uh what kind of gear do you like to play on yeah so um and in addition to being passionate about making music and performing. I'm also almost as equally passionate about the the engineering and uh, mixing side. Sometimes I'll buy an album just to hear the mix because I, I'm a fan of the mixing engineer, even if I'm not a fan of the music necessarily. So over the years, uh, I've been able to kind of hone in on some uh, some plugins that I use. Uh, so, so you want me to go through the gear list? Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's pretty basic, yeah. So I use a, uh, I'm looking at it now, it's a little audio interface called the Scarlet 212 by Focusrite. Um, I'm using, same one I'm using right now to, to uh, capture the audio is a uh, MXL 2001 condenser microphone. I've had it for like 10 years. It was 80 bucks 10 years ago. And I use um, the, the same keyboard you see in all my videos. It's a Yamaha P155 digital piano, which is actually recorded via MIDI. And all of the audio goes into uh, Apple's um, recording software, which is called Logic. Most people are, are used to uh, hearing about Pro Tools. I use Logic. And the key thing in getting the sound that I get in my videos, especially also the, the, the later the past couple of years, is working with EQing, adding the right kind of reverbs 
the right kind of audio compression is a huge one, which people seem to, uh, they don't realize or they forget about. And um, it can go a long way. You're not, you're not changing anything in your performance. You're really just enhancing the audio quality of, of what you've already captured. Right. Now, I hear you that that's probably the best thing that happened when I went through and made that album is I worked with a really good sound engineer, and I certainly am not a genius at it, but it changed the quality of my videos dramatically because enough of that knowledge rubbed off during the mixing and mastering process that I could see. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a big deal when you get the frequencies set so that you're not fighting different things sure. aren't fighting with each other. You know, and of course, there's a whole bunch yeah. of frequencies Every, that aren't even music. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, yeah, I noticed, and you're, you're using a different setup than you used to, right? Uh, yeah, well, uh, last year when I decided I wanted to, because uh, I've been writing songs for years, and I had this backlog of music that I wanted to do something real with, and I said, well, because the, the big piano that I have in here, my Baldwin Pianoville, I used to have out in my living room, and it wasn't set up well to film and, and do things with. So I said, well, I better reorganize this and get that in here because that's what I'm going to want to record all of my audio stuff with because it's got yeah. the best patch. And uh, once I got that in there, I realized that's what I should be doing all of my performance videos on too. So, But it it's taken, it's taken some time. There's a lot of – I'm like you. I'm like uh, – I, I have mixed emotions. On the one hand, I'm happy when people discover me through all of the old videos I shot, and there's a lot of them. But, yeah. um, boy, I wish that I could have that many views and just have them focus on the ones I've done in the last, like, year. I know. it's Yeah, <laughs> it's frustrating sometimes. I had someone – there was a Facebook group. Uh, I forget the name of it, and apologies because uh, I forgot off the top of my head. They, uh, they have people that subscribe to their channel – because they promote music that they find online. And they found a video of me doing your song from back in 2012. And the, the video has like 300,000 views. And it's just in a couple days on the Facebook page got like 15,000 views and like 300 shares. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I was like, man, I wish they shared one of my... Uh, my newer, my newest videos, but I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for sharing. Yeah, and Thank that's you. the thing. And it's like I can't, I can't justify getting rid of a video that's already got that much because it exactly. goes high in the search rankings, and I am trying to be seen. Yeah. So, but and I guess if if you could think of it in a positive way, if you have someone who's turns into a real fan. They'll be able to go back and see how much you've progressed over the years. Well, like, and you know, and I also try to remember this too, like you're always going to be your own biggest critic, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think Billy Joel looks back and says, yeah, I really wish I'd have done a better job the way we recorded only the good die young. And I'm yeah. like, really? <laughs> you know, but I know it probably like it's perfect, feels that way, you know? So, right. um, okay. Thank you for the gear list. And, uh, let's talk about your songwriting and recording for a minute. <laughs> um, so you say that you have made uh, three studio albums. Now, are I think I've seen a video of you playing the drums too. Are you a multi instrumentalist? Yeah, I I do play the drums. It's kind of just for fun. I, I love the drums. I always have. Uh, I've never played drums in a band. It's something I that's on on my list of things to do in the in the near future, hopefully. Uh, but I, I haven't done a drum video in a long time. I'm actually in the process of moving, as you can tell. My apartment's pretty empty. Uh, but I, I sold my uh, electronic drum kit, and hopefully I'll be buying a, a newer one in the, the near future. But uh, aside from piano and drums and the occasional harmonica uh, on Like a Rolling Stone and Piano Man, that's mm -hmm. basically it. Yeah, yeah, I, I know the. It's funny, uh, I play Piano Man at basically every gig I ever do, and uh, I have people come up often and go, oh, you play harmonica too? And I'm like... Yeah. I can't really go with that statement. No, I right. play this one song and I'm playing it upside down. So no, yeah, I I really exactly. don't. It's <laughs> yeah, really it, don't. it looks more impressive than it is, I guess. Uh it's yes. a pretty simple instrument to play when you're playing it just for a song like Piano Man, but if you're really going to play like uh you know, like John Popper or uh Stevie Wonder, Wonder, forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I am not a harmonica player. Uh so 
Yeah, because I saw you play drums on a video, I think, for uh, Stormfront, which is one of my favorite backbenchers. Oh, I, I thought, it, tell me, did you become a fan of Stormfront because you got the Yankee Stadium video and, and watched that and thought, my God, what a great way to start a show. That's I think you're a psychic. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, I bought Billy Joel Live at Yankee Stadium, which I, ha I have on DVD still, and I think that was 1990. Mm-hmm. And if you watch it, you definitely could tell it's 1990 with all the uh, video effects that they used and everything, uh, and and what everybody's wearing on stage. But uh, yeah, oh, I love I love that album. And I went to I went backpacking in Europe ten years ago with a group of friends and a lot of long train rides. And I got really into the Stormfront album. I would listen to it. There's a a song on there which I don't think Billy Joel has ever played live. I don't even think he likes it. I happen to really love it. It's called State of Grace. Yeah, you, it's fantastic. I love I, that song. So does, uh, you know, another guy who loves that song is Jeff Jacobs, who played on that record. And he talked about how he felt like that's an underrepresented tune. It on is. That it's when a I spoke beautiful song. I love that song. Yeah. yeah. That, that whole record. Progression. Great chord yeah. progression on that. I know. I love that. And I also love, um, <clears throat> I was a big fan at the time anyway of oh i am still i think leningrad's one of the best songs that billy's ever written in his career so i agree you know so anyway we could talk about that for a long time but we won't yeah. what i wanted to know is so do you do <coughs> on on your recordings is it uh, do you sequence any of it or have you always used all live other musicians for every part for the first two records that i did i did the first one in 2006 I did the second one in 2010. Uh, they're not currently available online anymore. Uh, so if you would like to hear my music, please go and, and check out my latest record, which I'll talk about next. But those first two, um, there was a lot of sequencing. There was sort of a combination. I think the drums were, were sequenced. Um, I'm trying to think what else. It's been so long. Some of the strings. And, and the same goes for the second one record there was some sequencing in the bass but the third record for the most part was all done uh with with real musicians and and you could tell i mean there's um there's there's something in the sound and and also in the um it, it goes beyond just what you hear when you get a, a true performance from a real drummer versus you know fake drum mapping on on a computer uh, so my my record that I did in 2013, which is one that came out, is called "Before I Fall." That's all uh, live. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I noticed that. I thought it had that sound to it, and I I admire that. The biggest problem I think a lot of independent artists run into is just where do you come up with the resources? Because it's expensive to have that yeah. many people in the room. But it it has a wonderful sound to it. I loved. I, I was listening to the songs. It's kind of. A, it's like an EP, right? It's an extended play. It's not a full. Yeah. LP, yeah, it's like five or like, six songs. I forget right. it. Five or six songs. Well, That's there true. are some really cool piano maneuvers in this. In this uh, before I fall, which by the way, folks, if you look down uh, in the comments area or in the description area, rather, I've got a link to it so that you can go check it out on iTunes, um, and. Uh, also, I, it's a, I, probably on Amazon, isn't it? I think so. It's also on Spotify and it's on Pandora as well. Yeah. So Last I, I checked before before I actually post this, my plan is to go through and and uh, find all of those and and link it up so that you can check it out. But uh, mm -hmm. I just thought there was some really awesome piano maneuvers, particularly like the opening of the Before I Fall song. I was listening to it. I went, my God, that could be on Cold Spring Harbor. You know, it just had this really oh, cool, you. you know. Um, I, so anyway, and, and the clarity on it's fantastic. Did you engineer that yourself or did you have a producer? No, no. My my uh, mixing and audio engineering abilities are, are very, very limited. I'm pretty good at doing piano and vocals, and that's pretty much – where it ends for me. I kind of dabble in other stuff, but no, I, we went to a, uh, there's a studio here in Los Angeles called King Size, and they have one of those, um, those old uh, Neve consoles, those analog consoles, and, and uh, I had a, a good buddy of mine who produced the album, and he had a whole team of people there that were engineering it, and I had a, a real good mixing engineer. Uh, of course, when I, 
if I ever listen to it now, I'm like, oh, I wish that was different and this was different. I wish it sounded like this and I wish the lyrics were this. That's always how it's going to be. Uh, yeah. But uh, overall, I'm, I'm pretty uh, proud of it. Happy well, with it. it's fantastic. I loved all of them. There, there's different tempos, different feels, different. Uh, I just I thought it was a really really great piece of work. You guys need to check it out. It's got definitely you can hear Billy Joel's influence in the way it was recorded. Uh, but like when I was listening to the St. Andrews song, I thought, you know, this sounds sort of like an Elton tune from the like really early days when he was doing those orchestral pieces on the the Elton John album and the Madman Across the Water album. And I, I thought, man, that's this just really cool. I loved it. So thank you. Check it out in the areas down there. So before we uh, before we in this lovely conversation, which I have really enjoyed and I appreciate your time. Likewise. Uh, what are, do you, I mean, I know the piano man is up there, but tell me uh, some of your favorite songs could be things you love to play, things you love to listen to. Uh, let us know who you are musically. You can tell a lot about a person by what's on their playlist. Sure. Uh, favorite songs to perform or favorite songs to listen to, or just a combination. Whatever, whatever comes okay. to mind. Okay. Yeah, I you know I, I play music at a piano bar a couple nights a week, and pretty much the number one question I get is, "What's your favorite song to play?" Uh, and it it usually varies, but uh, there's a song that I love so much. I actually did a cover that you could see it on my YouTube channel um, called uh, "Wider Shade of Pale" by Procol Harum, and I've always loved this song. And I was listening to uh, the Howard Stern show. I'm a big Howard Stern fan. Always have been. And he had uh, Billy Joel on a few years ago. They did a uh, a serious town hall event. Did you hear it, Steve? I haven't heard it, but I know of it. Oh, you got to check promoting. it out. Weren't they promoting the Madison Square Garden residency kind of? Yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. It was it was amazing. Anyways, uh, Billy Joel he he did a a version of it. So I've kind of modeled the way I play it after how he played it, and it's just such a a beautiful song. I have no idea what it's about what it means but there's something about the melody and and the, the way that that song was originally recorded and it's just amazing so that's probably up there uh others man that's tough um i'd say for me one of my the biggest um kind of the the biggest moments that i remember uh, discovering billy joel's music uh was listening to scenes from an italian restaurant because all of the the changes in the the, the tempo and the key changes and and it just it blew me away, and he has even said that he modeled that song after the B side of Abbey Road. I've heard that story. Right, the whole Golden Slumbers suite mm -hmm. at the end, and I I mean I'm I fanatical about the Beatles music. I love music that when you listen to it, uh, the structure of the song takes you to a place that you're not expecting. You're like, oh, I did not expect him to go to that chord there, but it works. Um, Another band that, that they haven't come out with something in a few years, but I love is a British band called Keen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have some incredible, incredible music. Uh, there's a song of theirs called Atlantic, which is on a record they did called Under the Iron Sea. One of my all-time favorite songs. It, it, gives me, uh, it gives me goosebumps when I listen to it. Sweet. Yeah. Well, along this line, I just, for, because... As you know, I have courted on my channel hardcore, as you have, yep. uh, Billy Joel and Elton John fanatics. And uh, so I have to geek out on that for one minute with you. Uh, before we leave, just the first five songs <coughs> that come to your mind when I say the name Billy Joel, what are the first five songs that come to your head? There's the prelude, Angry Young Man is up there. Uh, there's the instrument, Italian Restaurant. Summer Highland Falls. Not now. I got to think of it. Those are definitely top three. James is up there. I love that song. Uh, another one. Um, there's okay. This is this is gonna throw you for a loop here. There's a song that he did on Glass Houses where he speaks French. And <laughs> you it's are a, the one. You are the one. Maybe a little bit cheesy, but Ouh, I. I love that song. I love the chord progression. I love the melody. Love it. So there's there's a quick five for you. Your okay. turn. 
Oh god. Uh, well, I can't not say Piano Man. It just it's I mean, it it's kind of a cliche at this point almost, but the thing is it's so symbolic and oh, like yeah. you, that song meant so much to me that that Ballad of Billy the Kid's got to be in there for me. Uh, Captain Jack comes in there for me because uh, when I heard the live version of Captain Jack on on uh, Songs from the Attic and the way he sang, especially at the end, you know, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, my God. Now, this guy's got a pair of cojones. I want to be able oh, yeah. to do that. Um, much like you, I think Summer Highland Falls has got to be in there. She's Always a Woman for me is right up there. And. As much as I love scenes from an Italian restaurant, somehow it misses the top five for me, and I don't know why, because I have an inordinate amount of respect for it. But I end up, um, I end up thinking more. Uh, Prelude and Angry Young Man are kind of probably in that spot, but I think in the top ten, you definitely would have uh, scenes. I don't know how you could leave it out. It's such I, an iconic. Yeah such an iconic piece of work and what i love most about it is is it wasn't a hit no. but it's become something that he can't not play you know and right. i think that's pretty cool when you yeah it's when amazing you're able to do that uh do the same thing with elton john five songs that just sort of mean elton john to you i mean number one but it's not even close funeral for a friend especially live that i have uh elton john live at Madison square garden dvd from 2000 uh -huh. And uh, he had he had two drummers. He had just brought back Nigel Olson on the drums, and he had another guy. I forget his name off the top of my head. Yeah, Char uh, Charlie Morgan, I think, was his name. Is that who it was? And it is the most spectacular, I think, live recording I've ever heard for any song ever. Is is a uh, funeral for friend? Loves lies lies bleeding. Another one, uh, Leave On is up there for sure. Love playing that song. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a kid. And uh, Candle in the Wind, the Princess Diana version came out. I used to, I wore that album out. I mean, just like everybody else did. It was the number one selling single of all time, I think, still to this day. So that's, that's up there, both versions. Um, there's a song on a record which I really love called The Tumbleweed Connection called uh, Come Down in Time, which is a beautiful song. I have one more. Uh, man. Oh, how can I forget it? It's maybe to this day, for some reason, there's something about it. I never get tired of playing it. Never get tired of listening to it. Your song. Yeah. And for me, I, I again, it. I certainly, I'm such a fan that I could pick songs that are less known. But your song and Candle in the Wind, I have to be in that. They're so absolutely uniquely Elton John. Yeah, uh, and they're iconic. Yeah, they're they're absolutely magnificent pieces of work, and and they are magnificent whether you play them with a band, play them by yourself, play them with an orchestra. It doesn't matter. They just such good lyrics and melody that you can't screw them up. Yeah. So those two have to be there. Uh, I would definitely have to throw in "Burn Down the Mission" for me. Oh yeah, I am a big fan of that song. I am really big fan of Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's. Uh, I, can I squeeze that in there? Make it like, make <laughs> sure. it sick for me. Yeah, exactly. I love that tune. And then I love also, th this is, I'm going to say this one title, but on, I'm, I'm going to say Circle of Life oh. because I think that Elton has done some really brilliant writing in the later part of his career, and it's always going to be overshadowed by the phenomenal success of what he did in the first uh, six or seven years of the 70s. Yeah. But, you know, the chord progressions, starting with the album The One and working its way all the way to his current work that he's been doing are just, you know, really cool. And he's had such cool piano stuff. I love The One. I love, oh, uh, yeah. I love you know, song. all of, you know, Believe, all of those things are just really great music but i think the circle of life is uh a spectacular i i saw him at the uh, coliseum in vegas oh in 2012 and they ended his final encore with the band anyway with circle of life and it was a really just a spectacular uh 
production. So, yeah, that's yeah. it's a beautiful song. Two quick Elton John stories. I I was so lucky to see him a couple of years ago uh, at the Jimmy Kimmel show, nice. and I was he performed in studio, so I was literally like ten feet away from him on his nice. red piano, and he had played "Tiny Dancer." And a song off of uh, off of the diving board, which is a beautiful, beautiful album. Um, and then I saw him again at Jimmy Kimmel just last year, but he was outdoors playing with the whole band, and I was right in the front row. I mean, I I went with my girlfriend. We ran up to the front. I was like, boom, right awesome. there, and it was incredible just to see him so close like that. But, uh, That's way yeah. cool. I have never been that close to Elton. I have, I, I got to tell you one funny story about Billy Joel before we yeah. <laughs> conclude. So in 94 in Iowa, they, they're playing at this football stadium and uh, he and Elton together. And I like you, I've been to, I've been to the two of them like five times together. And then I've been to each of them like at least 10 times a piece, you know, since. So, so I'm like you. I've got a pretty good, pretty good catalog of uh, live appearances to draw from. But I was at the uh, t-shirt and and ball cap stand, basically, you know, buying souvenirs at this thing. I'm 15 years old, 15 or 16, and uh, this golf cart. You know how the if if you're in a football stadium, that's like they have a track almost around when you're up by the concession stands and stuff that goes all the way around. So you're outside of the seating, but you're still inside the structure. This right. golf cart starts driving up and I'm hearing people making noise down the way. I'm like what the hell I turn around and driving this golf cart around on the track is Billy Joel, just kind of being a ham and he's got his stormfront sunglasses on. Oh man, which, that's awesome. Which I'm like, <gasps> And I'm really glad, like, I'm really, really glad that I got to see him in, in that year. Because in 94, the thing you have to remember is the Lion King soundtrack was one of the biggest things in the world at that time. So Can You Feel the Love Tonight was humongous, yeah. humongous at that moment in time. And the River of Dreams album was only a year old, so he was still effectively touring for that. And so both of them were still kind of major forces in popular music at the time and billy still looked like himself instead yeah. of like the uh you know the old man that he and he makes fun of it too otherwise i wouldn't say anything about it right but, you know it's like the last time i saw him he comes out he goes hi i'm billy's dad yeah <laughs> yeah know? he, he always know? makes that joke he's he and he really does look like his father if you ever see a picture of him so but anyway so i'm standing from me to my computer screen from billy joel wow and he looks just like Christy Brinkley's husband with the glasses on. And I, was, and I couldn't really think of anything to say, so I just screamed his name really, really loud. Was, Billy! Yeah. <laughs> and he took it in stride because he was driving pretty slow. He turned and he looks at me and he goes, hey. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> so... Yeah, I told that story to his daughter, Alexa Ray, when I met her at a hard rock cafe about seven or eight years ago. And I said, just tell him I'm not that much of a creep anymore, okay? <laughs> so funny. Yeah, that's cool. That's a cool, cool memory. So anyway, well, Kevin, this has really been a pleasure. I'm going to let you get back to your life, but I wanted to, to introduce you to my people and let them know that if they're not already fans, they ought to be. And uh, I wish you nothing but success. And one of these days, I don't know how, but I'm going to arrange for you and I to be in the same room, and we're going to duke it out with a That'd couple be cool. of pianos. Yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, and thank you, Steve. Thanks for for doing this. This is uh, this is cool, really cool. So uh, thank you. My pleasure. Hang back for one minute after I uh, sever the tie here, okay? Okay. Hey, ladies and gentlemen. This was Kevin Lawrence. This is Piano Man Steve's Independent Artist Spotlight. Thank you for tuning in, and I will see you on YouTube. Bye-bye.